Well, the Lord is good. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and turn with, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing, and we pray that you continually move in the promises that you've given to us. And Lord, give us understanding. Let my words be yours and yours be mine. And may we have ears to hear, may we have eyes to see, and a heart to perceive, and faith to act upon it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So, Acts chapter 8, and verse 1. And we've been talking about, this is going to be our last, last Sunday for the uh, series of the Acts of the Church. Next Sunday, we're going to talk on the blueprints. But today, we're going to go ahead, and it's going to be not the last of our series, but probably last part of this series. We'll start a new, a new name for the series, but it's going to be under the Acts of the Church. But what happened in Acts chapter 8 it says here that in verse 1, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. Talking about Stephen. Stephen had been, um, had been martyred for Christ. And in the process, it goes on and says, And at the time of, of great, and at that time, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him and Saul and as for Saul he made he made havoc of the church entering every house and dragging off men and women committing them to prison now we understand that Saul was in a place where he was in bad situation he was doing a lot of bad things and what happens is he created great havoc for the church Stephen had been martyred. They had never had a martyr up to that point. Stephen was the first martyr in the New Testament church. But yet in the promise of Acts 1 verse 8, he said, you shall receive power. But Stephen received power to not only be a witness, but the word witness actually means to be a martyr. He was the first martyr that the church had ever known or ever seen. And so what happened was, then from there, what began to take place was Saul begins to wreak havoc on the church. But God has a plan. Look at your neighbor and say, but God has a plan. So we see here that all this stuff's going on. Saul made, or Saul made all kinds of havoc on the church. But then what happened was Saul is literally walking on his way and begins to, to go to Damascus. And while he is on his way to Damascus, at that point in time, we know, we read that a great light appeared. He was literally knocked to the ground at that point in time. His, he said, Lord, Lord, Lord. Uh, um, or he, he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? It was hard for you to kick against the goads. That literally means the pricks or the sticks that would go against the, the, the cattle or the oxen of the time to where they would have to, if they would try to kick against it, they would kick against points. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, any cattle at any kind of fair. You see those guys, when they show the cattle, they have those sticks, those show sticks, and they have the points on the end. You can imagine two of those at, at a cow's rear end, that's going to be the thing that's going to move him forward. So all that stuff's going on, and, and all this stuff is being taken place, and yet Saul is just wreaking all kinds of havoc. But we see it in Acts chapter 9, turn with me there. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the, the, against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest to ask for letters from him, from, from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that, if he, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly a light, a light shone around him, around, uh, uh, shone, from, shone him, around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard the voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, why are, he said who are you, Lord? Now at that point in time, he said, Lord. That's really important for us to understand because what happened was when Saul acknowledged him as Lord, at that point in time, he received salvation. He said, who are you, Lord? So I don't know about you, but there are times where I've, I've known people who when they say that when they're accepting Jesus, they, said, they start to call him Lord. When that begins to happen, they are making him Lord of their life. Does that make sense? And it goes on here and it says, he says, uh, the Lord, the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads or the pricks. So trembling, he, so trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? See, he's already saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, the reason I'm, I'm going to talk about this is because two weeks ago, before we left for vacation on a Sunday, 
There were some prophetic words in the second service that was saying, arise, and Lord, what do you want us to do? And I'm kind of paraphrasing things together. Now, what we have to understand is that the spirit of prophecy is like, uh, like the wind. And you've got to understand that the Holy Spirit moves upon a church, moves upon a people. And when he moves upon a people, he is looking for a people to acknowledge him. And we have to understand the promise that he's given us and find it in the scriptures. Can you say amen? So we have to understand. See, when the, when the Holy Spirit begins to interrupt your day, you have to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Amen? There's going to be all kinds of things that we're going to have planned to do. But when God interrupts our day or interrupts our week or interrupts our time, we have to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, arise and go to the city and you were told and what, of what you, and you will be told what you must do. The men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. They led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there for three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, it goes on here and it says, now there was a certain disciple, say disciple. This is very important. God wants to use all of us. It does not say he was an elder. It does not say he was a deacon. It does not say he was a pastor, a fivefold minister. It doesn't say he was any of that. So we don't have to elevate him to a place. We understand, listen, we're all disciples. I'm a disciple. You're a disciple. We're all disciples of Christ. And he goes on. He says, he said, um, a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias said to him, Lord, or, and, 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 sorry, and to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. Say this with me. Here I am, Lord. See, this is really, really important. When the Lord interrupts us, we need to say, here I am, Lord. In this season, we've got to be ready to say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, because this is where we're at. Things are happening at a rapid pace. Harry and I was talking before service. We are in harvest season. You know how I can tell you this? Because people want to know how they can be saved. People are in a place where there's more fear on the earth than we've ever seen. One thing that happens is that when the enemy tries to bring so much fear upon the earth, the saints of God are to walk in faith to be ready to proclaim the gospel. So Ananias said, here I am, Lord. So there's going to be times where you're going to be called upon. There's going to be people that you're going to be called to go to that you wouldn't normally want to go to. That's okay. Here I am, Lord. And so the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one, for one called Saul of Tarsus, who, for, for behold, he is praying. And in, in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias, said, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Now, here I am, Lord. I want you to go and I want you to lay hands on this guy who's known to murder people. Lord, you know he's known to murder people. I mean, here I am, Lord, but don't send me there, right? He says, here I am, Lord. And then he goes on and he says this. And the Lord answered and he said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentile, Gentiles, kings and children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my namesake. Now, Ananias is saying, Lord, you know what this guy has done. Now, God's not going, wow, you know what, you're right. I didn't, I didn't think about that. No, he says, go. See, so many times we have it in our minds certain predetermined opinions of what we think. And the Lord just simply says, no, go. Let's not hold back. Let's just go. See, he, the Lord's not looking for our concerns or opinions. He's just looking for our obedience. He says, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles. He's already got things he's called to do. And so go, go into that place, go. And so it goes on, it says, Ananias went his way and entered the house and laid hands on him. And he said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, he knew 
by knowing that the Lord had told him to go and that he was a chosen vessel, that he must have already received salvation. Something had to happen between there. And he goes on, and it says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came set, has, sent me, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like that of scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized, and he received food and strength. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples in Damascus. Now, he arose, he, he, he laid hands on him, and immediately the scales fell from his eyes. So the first thing that he saw was Ananias. Now this is very interesting, because Ananias, his name literally means graciousness, or grace. So when we look at this, and we understand this, I had, I had no, uh, no um, intention of speaking on this, these were things that we, I'd went down to uh, Colleen and Bernita's and Pastor Jeff was down there and I had been studying on the Acts and so he's like, well, let's talk about this. And so we went through and began to talk about this and he started showing all this stuff. And see, here's the thing, is that when those who are bound in sin are looking for something real, you're the, you're the, per, you're the person, you're the actual officer of grace that, are, that is to be the one that they're to see. You are the one. You're the one that they're to see. You're the one that's to go and to lay hands on them. You know, you're the one that's to go and to make a difference. And people say, well, I'm not anointed to do that. Well, Ananias was a disciple. Are you a disciple? If you're a disciple, then that means you're anointed to do what the Word says. Because what happened was Saul was blinded by what he had seen. Now, it's very interesting to me because what happens is, is that Saul was a man who was driven. He was driven to do all kinds of evil things. That's why you have to be so careful with those who are driven. We cannot be driven because if you're driven, it's by your own zeal. But when you're, when you're led, it's by the Spirit of God and a surrender of yourself to Him. So at that point in time, Saul then was no longer driven. He had to be Led. Now this is so interesting. Let's jump back up to verse 7. It says, Then the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice and seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. They led him. He was no longer driven, now he was led. So the blinding of Saul literally began to open his spiritual eyes to understand what it means to be led because this was a man who was driven, who had lived the life of a Pharisee, who had lived a life where he understood the law and was actually blameless is what the word says. He was blameless in the law. So what happened was he now had to be led by the Spirit. Well, see, Ananias was led by the Spirit to go to Saul and to lay hands on him. And what happens is you and I right now in this season are going to be led by the Spirit in different places and different ways, and we cannot be driven. Driven means that you're doing it your own way. But when I'm led, I'm led because He's leading me. I'm doing what He is calling me to do. And I'm not talking about getting crazy and and loopy on things, but I'm talking about doing what the Lord actually wants us to do. The church said the church was birthed so that they would be able to be agents of transformation. Your church was birthed so that you would be able to see Jesus Christ exalted in your life and in the life of others. Can you say amen? That's why you're going to have things happen in your life. Listen, there's going to be all kinds of pressures that's going to happen in your life. And there's going to be all kinds of situations and circumstances that are going to happen. But in the process, when we can't see what we are to do, we have to be led in that season. Does that make sense? You're, you've got to be led in the season because what's happening right now is we are in a time where people are going off of what they see and what they hear. And they're going off of what they see and what they hear to determine what they're going to do. But Jesus Christ did not do that. Jesus didn't do that. He did it in righteousness. 
So if we understand that we are to, to literally judge in righteousness, that we're not judging by the seeing of our eyes or the hearing of our ears, but in righteousness we are to judge. And then what happens is at that point in time we now begin to realize there's a reality that we are to walk in that's not in this world. Can I tell you that the Spirit of God does not live, He not, does, is not a natural God, He is a supernatural God. So now that you are born again, you are a supernatural person. Look at your neighbor and say, you are supernatural. Now look at your neighbor and say, you're supernatural in the natural. <laughs> you, are. you are. You are a supernatural being. Your spirit is alive and now you are walking in the natural as a spirit being that is alive. Where other times before you met Jesus, we were dead. You were dead, I was dead. But when I met Jesus, I became alive in Christ. So now I'm a supernatural being. You're a supernatural being. And there are going to be things supernaturally that you're called to do. And in those things, you've got to be ready to do them. That does not, we, what we have done is we've replaced the supernatural with the mystical. You can't be mystical about it. Supernatural. Listen, I don't, think Saul, I don't think Ananias wanted to go and talk to Saul. I mean, Lord, I heard how many, I heard from many about this man. Lord, have you heard about him? I mean, this guy's crazy. He's killing folk. And you want me to go talk to him? And the Lord says, go. Now that is supernatural. It's not mystical. You know, it wasn't about how great Ananias was going to be. It wasn't about all the stuff. It wasn't even about how great Saul was going to be. Because he says here, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. How many things he must suffer. Hey, has anybody, we live in a farming area, has anybody ever um, been in a place where you've had to, I don't know, like bale hay or pick corn or any, anybody ever been in that situation? Now, in those situations, there's not, they're not fun. Anybody ever baled hay in 90 plus degree weather? It's not fun. Anybody ever had to stack square bales of hay? in top of the barn at 90 degree weather where you know at the top of the barn is more than 90 degrees and at that point in time it's not fun there is some suffering that has to take place but what have you done you have built up what needed to be built up you've done what needs to be done in the same way so in the same way in the body of Christ we got to realize there are things that we're going to do that are not going to be fun but are going to be purposeful in the kingdom of God. Let me ask you this. What if you had to go through something so that three other people would come to Christ? What if that suffering was the most suffering you'd ever had in your life? For three other people. Now sometimes we say, well, Lord, you know, can you make it more than three? I really want this suffering to count. But what if those three people are what he has for you what about that that's the things that we have to really look at because you shall receive power to be my witnesses you shall receive power to be my martyrs and that's the thing that we don't like to hear in the American church but as we heard I don't know how many were here uh, two Wednesday nights ago but you know Pastor Bernard was here and, and, and from Nepal and he was talking about going up to a mountain and he was going up to this mountain to, to witness to this village that had not heard of Jesus, that didn't know Jesus. And he was eight hours, I believe he was eight hours on his way up there, and his feet were hurting so bad. And he was just really tired, he was exhausted, and he said, let's just turn around and go back, we'll get them next year, next spring. Um, and so he did, they turned around, they went back, and they went up that next spring. And as they went to go up that next spring, the village had been washed away due to a landslide, I believe it was. Is that correct? And the landslide took out the entire village. And he was not able to go up to that. And he shared this with us. And he talked about how that was something that, you know, he had to go to the Lord and he, he, he wept over. He cried over these people that did not know what it meant to have salvation. And yet, what happens is, is that we have to realize is that there are going to be some sufferings that we're going to go through to some people that we don't know. But in the process, if they come to Christ and it glorifies Him, that's all that matters. 
That's all that matters. Because what we do is we got to realize is that we're doing all this for him. That's the only reason we do this is because this is all for him, that he would be glorified, that he would be exalted, that he would be the one that continually is magnified in this time. So what happens is this, is that I just want to go ahead and share this with you. While I was down there in North Carolina, Pastor Jeff had this prophetic word that the Lord gave him. I thought this was such a good word, I wanted to share it with us all. And he says, and it literally says this, it says, welcome to your new season. We look forward to watching you shine. Welcome to your new season. Can anybody, can you tell and discern in the spirit, by the spirit of God, that we are in a new season? That things are different than they've ever been. And we are in a new season. But yet God believes in you. Now, we see here, when he said to Ananias, when, when he said to Ananias, he says, he says, Ananias, and the Lord, and he, and he answered and said, Lord, this is verse 10. He said, here I am, Lord. And so the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for the one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. See, he's telling Ananias what to do. He's giving instructions. So one of the things that we have to do is in this new season, we have to hear the instruction of the Lord. Now the instruction of the Lord is to always build the local church. It's, it is, it's true. Because what had happened with Saul, when Saul became Paul, what took place? He then, be, he then began to build churches. So it's not about, and, and see, there were sufferings that went on in that. There are things that we are going to go through that are for his glory and for his honor. And so there are things that we are to do. And yet in this new season, welcome to your new season. We look forward to watching you shine. So what do you mean we? Well, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit looks forward to watching you shine. They believe that the Spirit of God, the, the, the Trinity, the God, three in one, looks forward to watching you shine. He believes in you that much that he believes that you can shine in the season. Is the season going to be hard? Absolutely. Is there going to be some suffering involved? Absolutely. But are you going to shine? Absolutely. Why? Because this is what the Lord's called us to. There's nothing greater that we can do in this time than to continually walk forward in the things of God. Pressure will be everywhere, but you will be secure in God. Pressure will be absolutely everywhere, but you will be secure in God. And you have to realize that. That the glory of God is going to speak to you concerning what you got to do. And you need to write it down. Write it down what God is telling you to do. Remember, Jesus doesn't do anything but build the local church. That's all Jesus is into is building the local church. Well, what does that mean, Dean? That means he's building his church by building people in the church. He's not into taking people from the church and separating them out. He's into building people in the church. Yes, you may be raised up. Yes, you may be sent out. Yes, that's wonderful. But he's still looking to build people in the church, not for our ministry, but for his. So when we do it for his ministry, then at that point in time, now all of a sudden things are being changed. We are being led and taught how to walk and be like Jesus. So we've got to walk out the words that God gives us. And that requires faith. Now, I want you just to picture this with me. Ananias is going to go to Saul's room and lay hands on him. Now, I want you to picture someone who has murdered a bunch of people. Now, when we picture that, we picture someone who's, you know, just it, like we would see in our minds, we often will picture someone who's either big or really, you know, burly or really mean or, you know, growls, got an eye patch, something crazy. You've got all these scars on them, whatever. I don't know. But we picture all this stuff of what this, may, this person may look like. And we begin to look or we begin to think how ferocious this person is going to be. But yet Ananias, a disciple, was led by the Spirit of God to pray for the very person who was murdering his own brothers and sisters in the Lord. Talk about maturity. And so he had to go, and as he went, he had to stand in faith. So he had to walk out the word. He said, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord, here I am. 
Good, I want you to go and I want you to pray for Saul. <laughs> have, you, have you heard about him? The Lord says go. So he's got to go. And I, I figure that tra travel to Damascus was probably very long. You know, they either walked or rode camel or something, a horse or donkey, I don't know what. But can you imagine if he was walking, it was like, oh my gosh. Anybody ever have those drives where you're driving somewhere, there's a situation going on you got to take care of, and you're just like, this is the longest drive ever. Why? Because your nerves are on end. And at that point in time, he's still got to do it. So we have to be led by the Spirit of God to walk out what God is saying to us. In this new season, God is going to tell you many different things. We have got to listen to what he is saying to us. So what happens is, the only thing that matters is what God says right now. It doesn't matter what's going to happen in the future. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It only matters what God says right now so that I can move forward in the things of God. So the thing that has to happen is I've got to arise and I've got to go to do what the Lord tells me to do. Now, <laughs> this word arise is a word that means that the last season you were in is now dead. The last prophetic word you had, the last promise you had, that last season you were in is now dead to you. And if you try to stay in that season, you will now be in a place where you're now living in something of old works and you will find frustration. So what used to be cannot be anymore. What only matters now is in the new season that we arise and go forth. So two weeks ago, there were prophetic words that were talking about arise. And then they began to talk about saying, that I'm paraphrasing, but the prophetic words were along the lines of, here I am, Lord, here I am. So when you listen to those prophetic words, you got to realize, and I came back and I thought, oh my lands, I, I, I thought, let me just really kind of pray on this so that I can understand exactly what the Lord is saying to the church, because the Lord is saying to this church, arise and get ready, because there's a new thing that we're going to. We're in a new season. And in the new season, the, the Lord is going to speak to us. Again, God does nothing. Does, he, Jesus does, is not into building anything else other than his church. So we've got to have the understanding and the mindset that the only thing that matters is that we build his church. Now, are we to work? Are we to do, go about our lives? Absolutely. I'm not talking about being, you know, kind of off like that. I'm talking about really building people up and being able to see people saved, see people discipled, see people raised up in the body of Christ. Jesus is looking to build his church, and he's looking to do it through you and I. So that means that you and I are in a place now that we, where we have never been. And we are in a season that we've never been in. So a new season, a rise, means the old season is dead. You're now in a new season. Don't go back to what you tried, used to try to do. You're now in a new season. So things are going to be different. Things are going to be absolutely different than what you've known before. And so as we do, there's going to be all kinds of new opportunities. So it is very important that we realize that we declare God's goodness throughout our lives. It is very important because he says, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire of the house of Judas, of the one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias goes on and talks about this. But then the Lord says, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles. He is a chosen vessel of mine. A disciple went and laid hands on Saul. Saul became Paul. Paul would go on to plant churches throughout Asia. And then he would go on and he would lead the Gentiles. He would be an apostle to the Gentiles and write three quarters of the New Testament. All because Ananias obeyed God. Think about that. All because Ananias obeyed God. So in our obedience, we don't know what's going to happen in years to come. But we do know that through it all, in our obedience, when we say, here I am, Lord, in this new season, here I am, Lord, and he says, arise and go, then that means that where I was is not where I can be anymore. I've got to go where God's called me to be so that I can do what God's called me to do. 
so that what happens is he is continually building his church. He is building his beautiful bride. Do you know that in the body of Christ, that when Jesus comes back for his church, he's coming back for a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And he's coming back for a people who are not trying to build their own empire or their own name, but it's coming back for a people who are only wanting to build what he wants. And that's what we're after. What he wants is what matters most. Amen? Let's go and stand to our feet. Father, today, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing and all that you're continuing to do. God, we pray that you would just continually show yourself strong. We pray, God, that you would just teach us in this time how we can continually arise and do what you've called us to do. Speak to us in this time, Lord. Let us walk in this new season to be able to fulfill all that you have called us to do in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you on Wednesday. Don't forget about Joanna Herndon, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then again on Sunday. Have a wonderful week. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in with us. I pray that this message today has encouraged you. I pray that it's challenged you, uplifted you. I pray that you came away from this message and this encounter with God, knowing that you have literally stepped into a place where you have heard the heartbeat of God and through everything. Now, in this time, I want to talk to you. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ or your relationship is not where it needs to be. Maybe you've walked with God at one point in time and you're no longer walking with him. Or maybe you say that you're a Christian, but deep down inside, you know there's compromise in your heart. If that is you, I want you to go ahead and pray this prayer with me so that what can happen is we can talk to each other again when we see each other, either in the church or in heaven. So let's go ahead and pray. Just repeat after me. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your son's blood. I thank you for the life of Jesus and for his resurrection. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent of them now, and I ask for you to wipe me clean by your blood. Come into my heart. I receive your salvation, and I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. I walk away from my old life, and I walk into my new life. Thank you, Lord. I am born again. In Jesus' name. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer, you are now born again. What I would ask for you to do is I would ask for you to contact the ministry, contact the church, and let us get to you some free material so that you can begin to receive discipleship. See, it's not enough just to pray a prayer. We want you to be discipled. Jesus said, make disciples of all men. So what we want to do is we want to help you in your walk. We want to help you to where you're being able to be discipled and you're being able to walk with Jesus on a daily basis. So thank you so much. God bless you.